Welcome to this educational video on common hand infections and their management. My name is Griffins, and I am part of the MD class of 2023 at the University of Calgary. I have made this video with Dr. Janine Roller, a plastic surgeon trained at the University of British Columbia. Today, we'll discuss important features on history, physical exams, investigations, and the management of common hand infections. Hand infections are common and arise from a variety of etiologies. Prompt assessment and treatment are needed. Common hand infections include cellulitis, perinicchia, felons, and tenosynovitis. First, a focused history is taken to identify the etiology and risk factors for the infection. The history should include the patient's age, handedness, and occupation. The HPI includes the mechanism and date of injury, progression, and previous treatments. A full past medical history including prior hand injuries, infections, and immunization status should be reviewed, including tetanus status. Risk factors for infection should be reviewed, including immunocompromised states, diabetes, and steroid use. Finally, medications, allergies, and social history such as smoking and drug use should also be reviewed. As always, a physical exam should start with ABCs. Vital signs should be taken and any fever noted. Then, examine the entire upper extremity in a systematic fashion. Signs indicative of infections are many, including the traditional swelling, erythema, warmth, and pain. Fluctuants may indicate an underlying abscess. To assess the vascular status, review the skin's color, if it is pale or violaceous, the temperature, and the cap refill. Examine the patient's active and passive range of motion and perform axial compression across the joint of concern to assess receptic arthritis. More severe infections may show palpable crepitus, skin necrosis, or signs of compartment syndrome, also known as the five Ps, pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, and paralysis. Additionally, look for lymphangitic spreading and lymphadenopathy. Assess for any movement restrictions and make sure to compare your findings with the contralateral limb. Investigations include basic labs, including inflammatory markers such as CRP. Creatinine kinase can help assess muscle damage and uric acid can help assess for gout. Open draining wounds should be swabbed for culture and sensitivity. Erythema should be outlined with a marking pen to help determine the progression of the infectious process. Imaging can include x-rays, ultrasound, CT, and MRI. This can provide additional information to assist in the diagnosis and subsequent management. Acute hand infections can be grouped broadly into two categories, superficial and deep. We will cover the bolded items on the left. Here are the superficial infections we will briefly review. Cellulitis is a non-necrotizing inflammation of the skin and subcutaneous tissues. It presents as spreading, diffuse erythema, edema, tenderness, and warmth. It is often accompanied by acute lymphangitis. The main pathogens are Staph aureus and Streptococcus. Febrile patients should have a septic workup and open wounds should be swabbed. X-rays can assess for collections, gas, and fractures. Ultrasonography can provide additional information on deeper abscesses. Treatment for uncomplicated cases of cellulitis include antibiotics, elevation, and wound care as indicated. The erythema should be outlined and dated to monitor progression. Next, we will cover perinicchia and epinicchia. The perinicchium is the fold of skin on each side of the nail, and the epinicchia is at the proximal aspect of the nail. Infections here are common and can occur from nail biting, manicures, hangnail, and finger sucking, or with occupations such as hairdressers. Acute perinicchia presents with redness, swelling, and pain along the lateral nail fold. It can spread to the epinicchial fold, becoming epinicchia. Purulence can build up and can even track to the pulp. Most acute cases of perinicchia are caused by staphylococcal infections. Chronic perinicchia is when the infection has been present for at least six weeks. It is more common in patients with diabetes or hands exposed to prolonged moisture. The infectious agent in chronic perinicchia is often candida albicans. 
The presentation of chronic perinicchia is similar to acute perinicchia, except the nail plate usually becomes thickened and discolored with distinct transverse ridges. Early on, the infection can be treated with warm saline soaks, antibiotics, and avoidance of strenuous activities. Non-draining persistent infections can be managed by elevating the nail fold off the nail plate to allow the collection to drain. This is best done under local anesthetic, such as a digital block. After draining the collection, the patient should continue with saline or betadine soaks, antibiotics, early gentle range of motion, and should improve over several days. A felon is an infection of the volar pulp. They characteristically present with rapid onset swelling and throbbing pain that does not extend proximal to the DIP joint crease. The etiology is usually a penetrating trauma. Staph aureus is the most common organism associated with felons. Early infection can be managed conservatively with soaks, elevation, and antibiotics. Surgical drainage is indicated if the pulp is tense or fluctuant. The incision is ideally placed paramedian to avoid sensitivity over the pulp. It is important to spread through the vertical trabeculations that divide the pulp into separate septal compartments to drain the entire infection. A small amount of packing can be placed and the patient can continue to perform soaks, take antibiotics, and do early range of motion exercises. Herpetic Whitlow is a superficial infection with herpes simplex virus type 1 or 2. It is common in healthcare workers, immunocompromised patients, and those who are commonly exposed to orotracheal or genital secretions. After exposure and over the subsequent two weeks, vesicles will form, coalesce, and unroof, forming characteristic ulcers, which can be painful, throbbing, and tingle. The natural course of the infection is usually self-limited with resolution after 10 to 14 days. The lesions are no longer contagious once they are epithelialized and no surgery is indicated. The diagnosis is usually based on clinical history and exam, but may be confirmed by culturing the vesicular fluid, a zinc smear, or a rise in serum antibody titers. This diagnosis should be suspected in patients with recurrent acute perinicule infections. As for treatment, do not do irrigation and debridement. Topical or oral acyclovir can be recommended for treatment of those with a prodrome of pain and decrease the clinical course in some cases. Deep infections can be further divided into synovial and hand space infections. Here we will cover infection of the flexor tendon sheath, which is a synovial space. The main synovial spaces in the hand are the flexor tendon sheaths of the digits, thumb, and radial and ulnar bursa. The synovial sheaths of the flexor tendons provide fluid-filled gliding planes in a closed compartment that allows excursion of the flexor tendons. The synovial sheath extends from the mid-palmar crease at the level of the A1 pulley to just proximal of the DIP joint. Here we will discuss pertinent anatomy. The flexor tendon sheath is a double-walled structure. The sheath of the flexor pollicis longus is continuous proximally with the radial bursa, while the flexor tendon sheath of the small finger extends proximally as the ulnar bursa. The radial and ulnar bursa communicate proximally at perona space, which is a potential space between the profundus tendons and pronator quadratus. Thus, infection of the radial or ulnar bursa can track proximally and spread to the other, forming a horseshoe abscess. Here is an example of a horseshoe abscess. Pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis is an infection within the synovial sheath. It usually occurs as a result of a penetrating trauma to the palmar surface of the finger. As the purulence within the sheath expands, it can impair vascular supply and result in tendon attrition and subsequent rupture. 
The four cardinal signs of flexor tenus synovitis, as described by Canival, include 1. Fusiform swelling of the finger digit, 2. Partially flexed posture of the digit, 3. Tenderness over the entire flexor tendon sheath, and 4. Disproportionate pain on passive extension. The most common organisms identified are Staph aureus and Streptococcus species. Pyogenic flexor tenus synovitis is diagnosed clinically. However, if the diagnosis is not clear, investigations such as CBC, CRP, and X-ray can be performed. Early infections may respond to conservative management with strict elevation, rest, and IV antibiotics. Failed non-surgical management requires surgical intervention, which involves incision, drainage, and irrigation of the flexor tendon sheath. The treatment plan for all hand infections should follow these five principles. 1. Infections should be treated with rest, elevation, and immobilization to protect the affected area, minimize edema, and decrease pain. 2. Infected tissue requires debridement, and all closed space infections must be adequately drained. 3. Appropriate type and amount of antibiotics for the given clinical situation must be administered. 4. As soon as pain, swelling, and erythema subside enough to allow it, hand therapy needs to begin. Five, lastly, reassessment is needed if no improvement is observed within 24 to 48 hours. This concludes our video on common hand infections and their management. Thank you so much for your time and attention.